This is a response video to Kent Hovind, but I'm sure you've gathered that already. So regarding the debate between creationism and evolution, the classification kind is an infamous word shrouded in ambiguity. However, Kent has put forth a definition for this term, while also expressing that evolutionists lack a solid definition for species. So in this video, I'll address both these issues. Let's start with a quote from Kent Hovind. Somebody said, Hovind never defines kind. Okay, it's very clear in the Bible. If they can bring forth, they are the same kind. A horse and a zebra can mate and bring forth offspring. Now, the offspring may be sterile, I understand, like a lion and a tiger can bring a ligon. It's the same kind, okay? If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. A lion and a palm tree cannot mate and bring forth. They are a different kind. This is a pretty clear definition Kent is putting forth. So he gives a few more examples and reiterates it a few more times and then concludes with this sort of retort. And if you want to get technical, let me, let me hear you evolutionists give me a good definition of species. Hmm. Let's, what's your definition of species? I want a good, solid, uh, rock-solid, airtight definition of species. I gave you one for kind. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Apparently, unbeknownst to Kent, you can actually Google a definition pretty quickly. And a quick one I found was, an individual belonging to a group of organisms having common characteristics and capable of mating with one another to produce fertile offspring. As you can see, the definition of species is quite close to the definition we have here of kind, the difference being able to produce fertile offspring. Kent acknowledged and dismissed this in his previous quote, but this is actually kind of an important factor in evolutionary theory. But before I launch into that, I'd like to address Kent's requirement for a rock-solid, airtight definition. When we're presented with distinctly different subjects, it's quite easy for us to identify the differences and assign a label or description based on those differences. And when we attempt to apply descriptions to a gradient process, like a color scheme fading from red to blue, there's no actual definitive point where one can objectively say blue begins or red begins. When we attempt to create labels and classifications for this scenario, or similar scenarios that try to describe sections of a gradient or gradient process, we have to keep in mind that it's our descriptions that are subjective. Reality is not going to conform to our boxes that we have built and constructed to try and make sense and organize what we observe. And this is the case in the gradual gradient of evolution. It's slow, gradual change over extended periods of time. This actually makes it impossible to have an airtight, rock-solid definition, especially pertaining to those organisms that reproduce asexually or otherwise do not mate as this definition requires. Anyway, moving on. Again, the difference between these two definitions is species requires fertile offspring. To illustrate why this distinction is important, imagine a single group of organisms that's split into two separate populations and subject to two different environments. Each of these separated populations will begin to evolve differently in response to the differing environmental pressures. And at any given point in time, they could rejoin, and if they're still capable of reproducing, and producing fertile offspring, then the lineage will merge back into a single line. However, if it's the case that they can no longer produce fertile offspring, then the lineages are past the point of no return and are forever separated. This is why they can be deemed separate species from here, objectively. I plan on addressing this topic a little more in depth in the future, but for now I'm going to move on with the topic at hand. So let's take a look at another Hoven quote. There are all kinds of, of animals, uh, varieties of animals, that can no longer reproduce. I've been told, I've not checked it out, but Alaska rabbits can breed with Minnesota rabbits, and Minnesota rabbits can breed with Florida rabbits, but the two extremes, Alaska and Florida rabbits, can no longer interbreed. Okay, They originally were the same kind and have now branched off far enough that they can no longer interbreed, but would still be considered the same kind of animal. They're a rabbit. They were originally able to interbreed and came from a common stock. So Kent has quite blatantly contradicted his previous definition. Previously, he clearly stated that whether two organisms can be considered the same kind or not directly depends on their ability to interbreed and bring forth. And here, he acknowledges that these two rabbits cannot interbreed, but still says they're the same kind, despite his previous definition. This is a blatant contradiction. So what Kent is doing here is giving in to a form of cognitive bias called confirmation bias. This is an extremely common bias that affects all walks of humanity. As such, some refer to it as the mother of all biases. 
So confirmation bias is the propensity to collect proof that verifies pre-existing anticipations, generally by stressing or going after proof that upholds such and at the same time throwing out or declining to look for proof that contrasts such. So it's clear that Kent is not relying on his definition of kind to determine what kinds are. Because if he was, the two types of rabbits, Florida rabbits and Alaska rabbits, would be unquestionably different kinds. However, since Kent already has a conclusion that rabbits are the same kind, he's willing to just throw his definition out the window and find other means to affirm this conclusion. So the proper way to go about this would be to establish the definition first and explicitly use the criteria of that definition to determine whether two given organisms are different kinds or not. And again, Kent is doing the opposite. He's using this definition only when it affirms a conclusion he already holds. In this example, Kent is concluding that the rabbits are the same kind because they come from the same genetic stock. He's using a completely different criteria to determine the conclusion. In fact, what Kent does is he looks at two different creatures, determines whether or not they're the same kind, drawing the conclusion, and then trying to find criteria to fit that conclusion, which is totally backwards. And this is why it's so demonstrable that Kent is succumbing to confirmation bias. Now in the following clip taken from his seminars, Kent appeals to the common sense of a five-year-old simply by apparent similarity in a rigged set of images. Who, anybody in here five years old? Who's five years old? Five years old. What's your name? Misty. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? Dog, wolf, coyote, and banana. Banana. All right, let's give Misty a hand. Very good. The other ones. And really, this term kinds doesn't tell you anything at all about a given organism. All this definition is capable of describing is a relationship between two given organisms, specifically their genetic compatibility or their ability to produce offspring. And since this term is relative in nature, it renders it unsuitable for categorizing or classifying organisms in an absolute way. This is equally as applicable to the term species since it shares the same nature. To illustrate this, I'm going to call in the law of transitivity, which states, In mathematics and logic, any statement of the form, if A is R to B, and B is R to C, then A is R to C. Where R is a particular relation, A, B, and C are variables, and the result of replacing A, B, and C with objects is always a true sentence. This is most familiar in the mathematical form, if A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. And just for fun, let's run through a quick example. Adam is in the kitchen, and if Adam is in the same room as Bruce, then Bruce is necessarily in the kitchen as well. And if Bruce is in the same room as the chainsaw-wielding maniac, then the chainsaw-wielding maniac is also necessarily in the kitchen. Therefore, Adam is in the same room as the chainsaw-wielding maniac. And this can simply be expressed by, if A is in the same room as B, and B is in the same room as C, then A is in the same room as C. So, to continue the definition, there are transitive laws for some relations, but not for others. A transitive relation is one that holds between A and C if it also holds between A and B and between B and C for any substitution of objects for A, B, and C. Thus, is equal to is such relation as is, is greater than, and is less than. The transitive law here is axiomatic, which means that it's self-evidently true largely due to the fact that it's not possible for us to conceive an instance where this could be wrong given a valid relationship. And both the terms kinds and species meet this criteria of a relationship. So to demonstrate why this is a problem, let's return to Kent's rabbits. Let's maintain the same criteria for kind and say that the Alaska rabbit is of rabbit kind. By this definition, we can tell that Minnesota rabbits, which can interbreed with these rabbits, must also be of the same kind, which are rabbit kind. And Florida rabbits, which can breed with Minnesota rabbits, are also the same kind. This is the conclusion of the transitive law. However, when we compare the Alaska rabbits with the Florida rabbits and find they cannot interbreed, they are not the same kind by this definition. So this has led us to a logical contradiction, which means this cannot be the case. And this shows how we cannot achieve absolute categorization based on a relative criteria. So in order to achieve this, we must establish a criteria that we can compare one organism to. This is what proper biological classification entails. And one such example is simiaforms. Briefly, simiaforms are a suborder of primate that comprises of the monkey, apes, and humans, and the criteria is based off observed physiological properties, such as the head is rounded, the neck is mobile, the brain is large with cerebral hemispheres well developed, and so on. 
So to briefly summarize, Kent will argue till he's blue in the face that one kind cannot turn into another kind, when in fact, his biblical definition is actually saying just that. Each of these rabbits, by this definition, is a distinctly different kind of rabbit. And though they've diversified enough to not be able to bring forth, they still are all rabbits. The previous classifications do not get removed. Like, all humans are still mammals. I plan on covering this more comprehensively in the future. But as this video is running longer than I had planned, I'm going to conclude it here. But before signing off, I'd like to bring one thing to attention. A YouTuber by the name of Fastlane Adam has cleaned up Logic's series debunking Kent Hovind. With Logic's permission, he's edited out all the cursing while preserving the meat of the content. And the reason for this is Kent has used the swearing and cursing as an excuse not to address him. So we shouldn't let this great effort of his go to waste. So on that note, thank you for watching.